Um, I think perhaps we ought to start. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for taking the time to come along to our webinar this evening. This is the second of our After Hours DEA webinar series, and tonight we're going to be talking about air pollution and its impact on human health. Air pollution is a massive public health risk factor that is under-recognised and poorly understood. I think everybody intrinsically understands that it has respiratory effects, but the, the effects of air pollution on human health are much greater than that. Tonight, we'll hear firstly from Dr. Ben Ewald, who is an academic and researcher very well versed in air pollution. He's going to present to us in a webinar format for about 30 minutes. And then once he's finished, Ben will be joined in a panel with um, Dr. Bob Vickers, uh, Dr. Kathleen Wilde and Doc Dr. Vicky Kotsirilos, all of whom are um, experts on air pollution in various ways. Um, before we go any further, I think it's very important that we acknowledge country. Um, First Nations people have never ceded the sovereignty of their land. All of us in Australia are on, are on stolen land, and I think it's really important that we offer our respects to all Aboriginal and First Nations people. Um, I'm on Ghana land. Greetings to a group of people in Ghana is Namani. So Namani to you all. And I think it's a sign of respect if people write the name of the land they are on in the chat. And I'd um, ask if everybody could do that, please. So yeah, first we'll hear from Ben. If you're ready, Ben, if you could start sharing your screen, that would be fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kate. All right, um, I'll just go to this screen. Hi there. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking a bit about air pollution and health and where the air pollution comes from and what we can do about it. So yeah, hopefully it's focused a bit on you know, place the, the topics where a bit of that because it might make a difference. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm a GP in Newcastle. <coughs> I'm a was an academic teaching epidemiology with the University of Newcastle for about 20 years. And for about 10 years I've been doing some work on air pollution, um, advising some of the local environment groups first up and then um, <coughs> getting involved in more national campaigns about air quality questions. So I always start an air pollution talk with some photos of the big London smog. This is more or less where air pollution science started off. <coughs> this was December 1952. There was a temperature inversion over London. At that time, a lot of coal was burned in people's houses for domestic heating. And <coughs> with still, with no wind and an inversion, the smoke just blanketed the city and this is Trafalgar Square in the middle of the day. And this is a policeman directing traffic with a kind of burning branch because <laughs> no one can see where they're going. There was descriptions of people going for a walk but not being able to see their feet. And although these are black and white photos, apparently it was a sickly yellow kind of color. So it was referred to as a pea super. And during that week, about 5,000 people died. So there was a very obvious effect on health. The undertakers ran out of coffins at first, it was thought that that might be a, a deaths brought forwards, you know, old people with fragile health who are about to die, might have been dying a week earlier. But in fact, when it was analysed later, there was, there was an increase in deaths over the following months rather than a decrease if it was just purely deaths brought forwards. So about 5,000 people died during this big smog event and maybe another five or 10,000 people in the months afterwards from a delayed effect. So obviously large health impact, and that kicked off the sort of study of air pollution as a health problem. Um, so what are the pollutants that we mostly worry about? Um, you'll hear me talking about particles, generally referred to by their size categories. Um, and there's three gases that are principally kind of concerned. There's nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and ozone. <clears throat> now these oxides often get referred to, NO2 is just one of a group of nitrogen oxides. So sometimes it's called NOx to refer to the group of um, several oxides of nitrogen. 
Same for sulfur dioxide. It's sometimes referred to as SOx when it's a multitude of different oxides. And then, of course, the air pollution that we breathe is always a complex mixture. So it'll have particles and gases and various other things in it. And just when you thought that sounded clear, then there's the problem of secondary particles. So in the atmosphere, SO2 will form sulfate particles that become part of PM2.5. So um, there's complex chemistry happening in the atmosphere where things change from one to another. So this is the classic slide from the American EPA showing the size of these particles. So PM10 is anything that will pass through a 10 micron filter. Um, so of course, PM10 includes PM2.5. Um, and likewise, PM2.5 is anything that will pass through a smaller 2.5 micron filter. So about five PM10s would fit across a standard human hair and four PM2.5s fit across one of those. Things that a medical audience might be familiar with, the streptococci is about a half to one micron across, or an E. coli is two to three microns. So similar size. A lot of pollens are in the 10 to 100 micron class, although some of them are up here in PM10. So, of course, how toxic something is depends not only on the size, but also the composition of it. And that's <clears throat> um, one of the problems in doing air pollution epidemiology is that what's in the 2.5 particles in one country may not be the same as in another country. And that's part of the complexity of understanding these health effects. So the size matters because it determines where they end up in the respiratory system. So <clears throat> the air pollution that matters is the air pollution that someone breathes in. If it doesn't reach a person's respiratory system, it really doesn't have health effects. Um, PM10 will land in the large airways, in the upper airways or in the trachea or the large bronchi. PM2.5 will stay suspended in the air for longer and will reach all the way down to the alveoli and can cross into the bloodstream and have been found in all sorts of different organs. Um, you know, even the placenta has been found to have fine particles from air pollution lodged in the placenta. So, and PM2.5 has the majority of the health effects. So, and that's because it can enter the bloodstream and have a pro-inflammatory kind of effect systemically. So the things that we know, so the largest health effects are from PM2.5 exposure. We know that it causes death from all, all cause mortality. That's well established. It causes lung cancer. It causes reduced birth weight. There was a very interesting results following the Beijing Olympics, where it was shown that you know, the air was cleaned up for six weeks because of the Olympics. And the babies born in those six weeks, well, who'd had those six weeks during gestation, had a better birth weight by 23 grams than babies born the year before and the year afterwards. Very strong evidence that this was a causal effect from the air pollution. Um, PM2.5 is also associated with non fatal heart attacks and with diabetes and with asthma. Now, it's rarely the only cause. You know, the air pollution hardly ever gets written on a death certificate, so you can't find air pollution deaths in the official statistics, but it is another risk factor in there with you know, smoking and obesity and lipids and all those other risk factors that we're familiar with thinking about. So it's another causative risk factor for those major diseases that cause most of mortality, which is you know, heart disease and stroke. So this is the first big study that um, convincingly showed that long-term chronic exposure, rather than the sort of an air disaster like in the big London smog, long-term lower level exposure is associated with mortality. And this is an article by Mr. Pope, C. Arden Pope III, lovely fellow, started life as an economist and only got into epidemiology later on. Um, and these are the, this is the key results from this uh, large cohort study. It was the American Cancer Society study. It had 1.2 million people in it, of which about 400,000 were in places where the air pollution had been measured. And this is the slope of the line here for all-cause mortality, showing 
you know, higher levels of air pollution had higher levels of mortality. That line is statistically significantly different to flat. Um, you can see that when restricted to just cardiopulmonary mortality, the line is a bit steeper. For lung cancer, it's steeper again, although this accounts for only a small number of the deaths. And reassuringly to me as an epidemiologist, all other cause mortality, there was no association. So that rules out that this was due to confounding or some other problem about where people lived. So I often get asked, well, what's the mechanism? How does it work? How do we know? And here is a, another very interesting piece of research in which a group of people, this is from New England Journal of Medicine from 2007, a group of men with stable ischemic heart disease were recruited to an experiment where they exercised on an exercise bike in a, an exposure chamber and they rode the bike for 15 minutes. So here you can see from, from time 15 to about time 30, this is their heart rate. So you can see that as they exercised, their heart rate went up and as they stopped, it came down again. And then they did it twice, once breathing clean air and once breathing air with some diesel exhaust in it. This was diesel exhaust at levels that the authors said was about comparable to what you might find if you went jogging on the footpath in one of the streets in, in this was in the UK where it was done. Now down the bottom here, you can see what happens to their ST segments on their ECG. So the doctors in the audience will know that the ST segment is a part of the ECG tracing that will sag downwards if the myocardium is struggling for oxygen. And you can see that when they were breathing air, the, it sagged a bit, but when they were breathing diesel fumes in their air, it sagged a lot further. So there was perfectly as much oxygen in the air, but the, the um, vascular function was damaged by the exposure to the diesel exhaust while they were exercising. So there's effects of air pollution um, that happen. Now they're studied through two quite separate different kinds of studies. So there are time series studies where you look at, you know, on a bad air day, do more people die than on a good air day? And those have very consistently shown increased deaths on bad air days at a rate of about an extra 1% of deaths for every extra 10 micrograms of PM2.5. But the other kind of studies, which is where you look at people who live in places with bad air and compare them to people who live in places with good air, this is looking at the annual exposures, um, and that shows a risk factor of about an extra 6% full cause mortality for each 10 micrograms. So the chronic effect is about five times bigger than the acute effect. And the chronic effect is not just adding up the daily risk across the whole year. So to think of this in, in realistic terms, you know, a person might have their heart attack, you know, contributed to by poor air that they've breathed all their life. But when they finally have their heart attack, it may not be on a bad air day, it might be on a good air day. So it won't show up in the acute um, changes. So <clears throat> that was one kind of point about the epidemiology. Next important point about the epidemiology is this idea of thresholds. So this is a, this has no real accident values on its axis. Um, usually the way air pollution standards are set and people want to say, well, what's the safe level of exposure? You know, how much can we breathe without it harming us? And that thinking is reflected in this line here, where you'd say there was no health effect up to some value. And then beyond that, there's a health effect. And the more the research is done, the clearer it becomes that in fact, there is no such threshold and the health effect continues right down to zero. So a little bit of air pollution is bad for you, more is worse for you at whatever level you're talking about. <clears throat> now this is a fundamental part of the science, um, but it really hasn't filtered through to the way politicians and regulators think about air pollution. They're always saying, well, you know, what's the national standard for this thing? And if the air is better than the standard, therefore everything's okay and there's not a problem. Okay, so as a health problem, the burden is large. <clears throat> so in Australia, the best estimate is about 2,600 deaths per year from man-made fine particle air pollution. And globally, it's thought to be about 10 million deaths per year. 
So Australia does have relatively clean air by global standards. And there are you know, many of these deaths are in China and India and Africa and the Middle East in places where the air is 10 times as polluted as in Australia. Another important point about this is that the exposure is universal. You know, it's not just certain people who are exposed to air pollution. Everybody has to breathe. Everybody is exposed to the air pollution in the area where they live. And of course, the exposure is involuntary. It's not a self-inflicted problem like smoking or eating a poor diet. Um, so, you know, you don't have any say in the air that you breathe. But the other side of it is that at, at a societal level, it's largely avoidable. So the sources of pollution that were necessary to have a good life in previous years, you know, if you had to burn wood or coal to heat your house and that was the only option you had, well, you know, people didn't have any choices. But now we do have choices and we do have technologies that can do all the jobs we need done without producing the air pollution. So part of talking about air pollution is to understand that you know, the health effect is there and is real. And mo for most of it, it can be avoided by things that are not too difficult to do. So <clears throat> a picture's always been a lot of words. I don't know how well you can see this, but there's a thick brown layer. This is the view across the Hunter Valley from somewhere a bit west of Singleton on the Mudgee Road. Um, and you can see there's a, it's a cool morning, so there's a bit of a temperature inversion. And this brown layer here has captured a whole mixture of mine dust and power station uh, smoke. And it's sitting there, you can see it in the sky. So moving on to the gases, I'll talk a little about uh, SO2 and NO2. Now, this is another Upper Hunter story. This is the satellite view of Musselbrook. There's the town of Musselbrook. These big scars here are the open cut coal mines. These red stars are the two coal-fired power stations. So you can see that's Liddell there that's going to shut in a couple of years. That's Bayswater over that side. And this is the lake that they use for their cooling water. Um, and the important thing about this is that in Musselbrook town, about here, there's an air quality monitor and you can download the data from that anytime you like. These are the daily averages of SO2 from that Musselbrook monitor over a period of about a year or two. And you can see that there's a lot of variability. And this is really part of the problem of studying air pollution is that what it is on one day may be nothing like what it is on the next day. Now, if we look at that in a closer time scale, this is hourly SO2 in Musselbrook. And you can see that for some hours of each day, the plume from those power stations is blowing over the town where the monitor is and the rest of the time it blows in some other direction and the monitor shows none. So SO2 is a particular, in this situation, it's a particular kind of air pollution that really only comes from the power station. There are no other sources. So it's very clear that this is, you know, there's one source of this. And when the air is blowing from one of those chimneys towards the monitor, there's a spike. And for SO2, it is a respiratory irritant. It will trigger asthma attacks in susceptible people. And that's one for which there probably is a threshold, that it's the worst hour of the day that sets off people's asthma. If you have one really bad hour, it doesn't matter how good it is for the rest of the day, it'll set off people's asthma. So um, in this case, it's the peak concentrations that matter more than the average. And those peaks will be triggering some asthma in susceptible people. <clears throat> now, this is... Um, that the, the plot of the 99th centile of the daily SO2 for a bunch of sites in the New South Wales monitoring system. And you can see here that this is Walls End. This is the suburb of Newcastle. It was not too far from where the coke ovens was for BHP. That shut at about the end of the 90s. And you can see the SO2 level, which was coming from the coking coal, dropped dramatically. This blue line here is a site in Sydney. They don't have heavy industry in Sydney and the levels have gradually fallen as they cleaned up the sulfur content in road fuels. Um, Musselbrook stands out by itself up here. You can see that it, it's in a class of its own. It's still getting very high SO2 levels and that's blowing st straight to that monitor from the power stations. You can see from international evidence, this is the trends in SO2 from the US 
you know, they're making steady progress with implementing the Clean Air Act over the last 20 years. And each one of these lines is one of the regions. Um, and you can see that across the whole country, they're making steady progress by cleaning up SO2 emissions, largely through installing scrubbers on power stations and through cleaning up some of the um, industrial smelting processes. Now, I'll talk a little bit about nitrogen dioxide. Um, so while SO2 virtually all comes from power stations, nitrogen dioxide comes from a range of sources, um, quite a lot from power stations, but quite a lot also from vehicle exhaust. So any high temperature burning process will produce NO2. And on this graph, you can see here, this is the hourly time profile at the Liverpool monitor. Liverpool's a southwest suburb of Sydney, which has often the worst air in, in of the Sydney suburbs. You can see that in winter, um, there's a very strong peak from the morning rush hour and from the evening rush hour. In summer, it's not such a, a steep peak. Um, so yeah, NO2 is also derived from vehicle exhaust. And of course, the NO2 that people breathe in is predominantly from vehicle exhaust because the cars are close by where the people are and the power stations are mostly a couple of hundred kilometers away from big cities. So the standard, the national standard for NO2 exposure is currently under revision. In fact, I just heard the environment ministers will be meeting tomorrow and possibly signing off on a new set of NEPM standards. NEPM stands for the National Environment Protection Measure, and that's just what an Australian air quality standard is called. So currently the annual standard is 30 parts per billion, um, but which is way higher than current exposure values. The worst places I can find in the country of ambient background levels rather than roadside levels is at 12 parts per billion in both Liverpool and Fitzroy. Um, and NO2, it's, it's sometimes regarded as a marker for the whole mixture of traffic related air pollution. So NO2 sometimes can be thought of as it's a marker molecule for the whole mixture that is vehicle exhaust. NO2 is highly non-uniform. Um, so this is, this is a work from London, actually. This is the big ring road around London. And you can see that there's a great, there's a large gradient in NO2 exposure between adjacent to the road and even just a kilometre or two away. So yeah, NO2, measuring NO2 at an urban background site doesn't necessarily capture the full exposure of the population. So I'll talk a little bit about some original research that was done in Australia. This was set up in about 2005 with the intention of informing the first revision of Australia's NEPM standard that had been set in about 98. So they recruited 2,600 children at 55 different schools. The schools were chosen because they were adjacent. They had a monitor within two kilometres of the school. So they had a history, you know, a record of what the air quality had been like over the years. This large cohort of children, no, it was a cross-sectional study rather than a cohort, a large group of children, the total asthma prevalence was about 15%. And they did a whole lot of lung function testing and questionnaires and measured their fractionally exhaled nitric oxide, which is a marker of lung inflammation. So it's a good way of making an asthma diagnosis. The exposure was measured in two different ways, either from the closest monitor to the school or using a thing called a land use regression model, um, which has as its inputs the presence of roads, industrial land uses, um, satellite data. So it's, it's a mashup of all those things. And it allowed them to allocate an NO2 value to each child's address. So it was a more precise exposure assessment. And of course, they adjusted statistically for all the usual socioeconomics and parental education and the temperature on the day of testing and area SETS and even how they did their home heating and what kind of stove they cooked on, a whole lot of adjustment for things that were thought to influence asthma prevalence. So in that group, the mean exposure was 8.8 .8 parts per billion and the odds ratio for an extra four parts per billion of NO2 was um, 
1.24. So an extra 24% increase in asthma risk for each four parts per million. So quite a strong association. Um, when they used the exposure assessed through the land use regression model, the odds ratio was even higher because that gave each child their own home address NO2 value, a much higher risk found that way. And the definition used for that, of course, was current, uh, it's 12 month period prevalence for asthma. So people who've had either wheezing or medication use in the last 12 months. So if you apply this risk estimate to the whole of Australia, it would suggest that a three parts per billion decrease in NO2 would mean we'd have 60,000 less children with asthma. So asthma is a very common problem. This is a quite substantial risk increase due to NO2. So even though Australia's NO2 is better than most countries in the world, and in this sample where the mean exposure was 8.8 .8 parts per billion, there was a strong association and a large disease burden attributable to that NO2. So you can see that the trend of NO2 in New South Wales was trending downwards till about 2010 or 2012. And since then it's been flat, um, making no further progress. That's mostly attributable to improved new vehicle exhaust standards. You can see that in the UK, where they measure both urban background, which is what that one is, um, but also roadside levels and rural background, there's been a, a much steeper decrease that's gone across that whole time period from 1990 to 2018. So other countries are making progress on this exposure value, and it's mostly done through insisting on cleaner vehicle exhaust standards. So I want to talk a little bit about what we can do about these exposures. Um, so the big sources, there's power stations, there's vehicles, wood burning heaters, and bushfires. Now, I won't talk about bushfires that much, except to say, well, we can't, we're going to have bushfires because of climate change and the country we live in. And all you can do there is personal protective equipment, you know, getting used to if the air's total rubbish, wear a mask when you go out for your exercise. Um, so a bit about power stations. This is basically a power station. <clears throat> Get some coal, grind it up, pulverize it, a bit like you're making coffee, throw it in a boiler, and the exhaust, the combustion products go up the chimney and the bottom ash comes out the bottom here. This boils water, which turns a turbine. And the pollution controls available are this range of things. So for sulfur, for SO2, it depends on getting, you can have, you can reduce SO2 by buying low sulfur coal. Um, I was looking at the declared, the national pollutant inventory lists how much of each pollutant each place puts out. And it was very interesting in the upper hunter that the amount of SO2 put out seemed to swing with the coal price. So when the international export price was very low, the power station was burning low sulfur coal because they couldn't sell it. When the international export price went up, it looked like they were burning cheap coal in Australia because they were selling the better quality coal overseas. Um, so, but for some of the power stations, there's not much choice about what sulfur, what coal they burn because the power station is built right on top of its mine. So the next part of the process is the furnace here. And it is possible to build a furnace in such a way as to have very uniform temperature distribution, which leads to less nitrogen oxides production. So upgrading the furnace to a low NOx furnace is one of the ways that a power station can improve its pollution performance. And that's been done in a few power stations, but not very many. Now, here in the chimney is where the real differences can be made. The New South Wales power stations all have bag filters that are highly effective at catching primary particles, but the power stations in Victoria and Queensland don't have those even. And then there's scrubbers that can capture the SO2 or the NO2 as it goes up the chimney. And no power station in Australia has those pollution controls because no government insists that they have those pollution controls. But any power station like this in North America or in Europe or in Japan, or in Korea, or in China even, 
would be required to have these scrubbers and would be allowed to emit only one tenth of the gases that the Australian ones do. So this is the National Pollutant Inventory report on NOx and SO2 and primary particles. You can see that for all of New South Wales, and I apologize to people in other states, this talk is very heavily slanted to New South Wales data, um, that there's 3,000 tonnes of primary particles, 190,000 tonnes of SO2, and you can see that the power station total is really most of the state total. So there's very few other sources, but for, for nitrogen oxides, you can see that the power station total is only, you know, it's less than half of the state total. <clears throat> so if you have a look here for a moment at my two local power stations at the bottom of Lake Macquarie, just close to Newcastle, we have a Raring owned by Origin Energy, which puts out 30,000 tonnes of SO2, and Vales Point, just across the lake, puts out 16,000 tonnes of SO2. And that is about in proportion to the amount of electricity they make. Raring is a much bigger power station. But when you look over here at the nitrogen dioxide, Bowles Point puts out more than a Raring. Even though it's only a half size power station, it does more NO2. And that's because a Raring spent the money about 10 years ago and put in low NOx burners and no longer produces as much. So one of the local environment groups here uh, was taking on Bowles Point, which is coming up to a license review. And, um, was interested in doing some local calculations. So I'll just run through how I worked this out. So there's some modeling was done by people at the University of Exeter, commissioned by Greenpeace. They used the National Pollutant Inventory Emissions and hour by hour weather data and the power station characteristics like how tall the chimney was and what's the exhaust velocity at the top of the stack. Um, and they put that all together to work out ground level NO2 for each local government area. So I put that together with the prevalence of asthma, which comes from the New South Wales Health Survey, and the risk of having asthma um, for each extra NO2 exposure. This is from a meta-analysis. So this is all pretty strong data. It turned out that the power station share of ground level NO2 um, in Lake Mac was about 2.5 parts per billion. So it's a small amount, remembering that the, you know, the highest annual amount observed anywhere in New South Wales was 12 parts per billion. Um, so if you look along the top row of this table here, in Lake Macquarie, local government area, the asthma prevalence from the New South Wales Health Survey is about 17%. There's 32,000 children in my age group of interest from two to 14 years of age which would give us 5,600 children with asthma. The NO2 from the power stations, now this is all power stations in New South Wales combined, but because these people are very close to two of them, this is the combination of Araring and Bowles Point, gives them 2.5 parts per billion NO2 exposure, which I can work out is expected to have caused the asthma in 321 of those children, which is 6% of the asthma burden. So for each LGA, Central Coast LGA is um, a larger LGA. It has a slightly lower amount of NO2, but a larger number of children with power station attributable asthma. So the local environment group was very interested in these numbers and did a bit of a Bit of an art, an artwork they described it as a, a media stunt, sticking 656 paper cutouts in the grass at the side of Lake Macquarie here, with Bales Point in the background, illustrating the number of children whose asthma is attributable to the various power station exposures. So that's a way of, of getting some public attention to this disease burden, and based on you know, I think quite solid science. Um, you know, not all these kids are due to that power station because the one across the other side of the lake makes about half the NO2. So, but about half of these would be attributable to that one power station exposure. So if you look formally at the amount of 
pollution put out by the power station and divide that by the amount of electricity that it generates in a year, you can get an NO2 intensity. So Vale's Point, that was the power station in the back of the ground of that photo, puts out 2,584 kilograms of NOx for each gigawatt hour of power, while the Araring with the low NOx boilers only does 1,200. So less than half the intensity of air pollution. And you know, this, this power station could be required to install those low NOx burners if the EPA ask it to. They can, they're well within their power to demand that those, you know, lower the license limits, which would require the power station to install the better equipment to comply with its license. Um, you can see the NOx amounts from all the other power stations around the country. Hazelwood was a bit of a shocker. Um, Gladstone is pretty bad. Um, and just for comparison, this is the PM2.5, the primary particles, PM2.5, across each of the power stations. Again, you can see that Tarong, which is in Queensland, um, is a real shocker for particles. Um, Tarong is some hundreds of kilometres from where anybody lives, though. So it's probably not creating much of a health burden because it's way out in the boondocks. You can see that all the New South Wales power stations here, these five, they all have bag filters, which is the modern highly effective pollution controlled particles, and actually you know, don't release much in the way of primary particles. The Victorian power stations over here, they burn brown coal. It's a much dirtier product. It makes much dirtier smoke, and the companies claim it's too dirty to filter. Um, if you put in a bag filter, they say we just clog up in the first day. So they use a process called electrostatic precipitators to catch some of the dust, but that's an old fashioned technology that really is not very effective. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about wood smoke. So wood smoke is a, is a large cause of fine particle pollution in winter time. Um, you can see this illustration here. This house here is smoking up the whole neighborhood. It makes an enormous amount of fine particle pollution. So a, a heater, a modern heater, which meets the standard that was, you know, the standards for heaters have been tightened up in recent years. The, the heater that could be installed in 2018 when burning five kilograms of firewood per hour pollutes as much per hour as 73 modern Euro 5 diesel cars. So it's a very large, it's out, completely out of proportion to the utility we get from burning wood for heating. Now, this is a, that a modern wood burning stove when operated as per the instructions. But of course, most of these heaters are not operated as per the instructions. People are burning wet wood in them. Um, they're being damped down so they burn more slowly and all those things increase the pollution. So it's estimated that the heaters in use actually produce about three times as much pollution as when tested according to the um, to the standard. So, and you hear terrible stories of, of people who are sensitive to wood smoke. You know, the people in this house may well get asthma. They complain about the wood smoke. The neighbor with the fire says, oh, I can't see anything wrong with it. And usually there's no legal recourse at all. And leads to terrible outcomes for, for people who are sensitive to that wood smoke. So there have been several interventions to reduce you know, the use of heaters over the years. Lawn system cleaned up its, um, had a terrible smoke problem because it's in a fairly narrow valley, gets temperature inversions. A lot of people use wood for heating because it's, it's cheap and they can get it, um, but it was causing terrible health problem there. They ran a program of, of removing old heaters and helping people put in cleaner kinds of home heating and substantially about half the amount of wintertime pollution in one system and had a corresponding decrease in, in heart attacks and, and deaths. So it is possible to do, but it's an uphill battle because people love their wood heaters and are often reluctant to give them up. So um, I don't need, so I suppose the things that are currently happening in the air pollution space, 
there's a, the, the Australian standards are under review, possibly to be signed off tomorrow by a meeting of health ministers. Um, for people in New South Wales, the Vales Point licence is under, is under review at the moment. They're trying to get themselves another five-year exemption from the pollution rules that would normally apply to them. New South Wales is developing a clean air plan and that's taking public submissions until the 23rd of April. So there's an opportunity to have a bit of a say there. The Victorian Upper House is having an inquiry into air pollution and that's underway and DEA has been preparing a submission to that process. Other things that are happening out there, <coughs> some people are running a program called Idle Off. This is a school program teaching children and indirectly teaching parents about turning off idling motor cars. They've developed some great school resources and that can all be found through their website there. Um, getting wood heaters out of urban areas is a priority. The, the most environmentally sound home heating is an electrically powered heat pump run from renewable energy. Um, so yeah, it's not, in the past, I think a lot of wood heater removal programs have had people installing gas, but that's another fossil fuel that doesn't have a future. So it really should be replaced with electric heat pumps, which are more expensive to buy, but cheaper to run. Um, places with coal mine dust, um, it really doesn't make any sense to be digging more coal mines when the existing mines are having trouble selling their product. Um, but that's what we're fighting about in the Hunter Valley at the moment. And of course, for all the vehicle associated pollution, which is much of the, the urban exposure is from vehicles. Um, you know, the first response is cleaner vehicles, but really a better response is less vehicles and shifting some of the transport burden out of private motor cars. So I wanna leave you with this um, slide here of all the places you can go to look up your state's air quality data. So each state runs a series of monitors. And if you know how you can get online on one of these websites and download the data from your closest monitor and start to understand <coughs> about the air quality issues in your own patch. And that's as much as I prepared. Over to you, Kate. Better unmute yourself. Whoops, got it though. All right, thank you very much for that, Ben. I've, every time I hear about air pollution, I think I learn a little bit more and I'm always just surprised by how pervasive and awful the um, effects on our health are. And also that it seems that in Australia where our, our, our sort of environmental standards about air pollution are pretty poor from a global perspective and that we just tend to kind of not pay much attention to it. You know, it just tends to be a bit ignored or, just, you know, you can't see it because it's gas, right? Um, there's been some really interesting talk in the chat while you've been presenting, Ben. And one of the things that's coming up a lot is the concept of pollution from fire. So obviously you touched on the wood fires at the end. And, um, you know, I've heard some stuff before about how, you know, home wood fire burning is a massive pollutant. But, you know, can, could, I'd like the panel to kind of comment about, you know, the climate fires or, you know, wildfire as the US people seem to like to call it and what they think the effects of that might be on human health. And yeah, does anyone want to sort of lead a discussion and pop in on that? Um, I can talk a bit about experience um, during the the big summer black summer bushfires that we had here we're actually quite lucky in the hunter that we have the value of the monitoring system already set up and it was already set up with an alert system with sms alerts and email alerts and for that system to be pre-existing was actually a really good example of something that knowing we're going to have statewide smoke exposure events like those um, that arguably is the gold standard for community protection from a, a a PPE perspective, because we talk about hierarchies of PPE and, um, and that a mask is kind of your last line of defense, um, staying away from the exposure is arguably the best. So if you've got a phone SMS coming through saying that fine level particulates today are well above the standard or whether they're a little bit close or high above, or at least getting a level um, so that people decide, actually, no, I'm not going to go and take my kids to park run this morning, or um, I'm not going to go to the beach today, I'm going to spend the day inside. Um, that 
I think is something that whilst we can't prevent those major events to an extent, I mean, we can get better at fighting fires, that, that hierarchy of PPE becomes really important in alerting people really early on. Yeah. Yeah, so that's sort of a public health application that can be used pretty obviously. Um, what about, yeah, Vicky, what would you like to say there? Well, what we found during the bushfire smoke uh, pollution pretty much covered most of Eastern Australia between 2019 and 2020 during that summertime. And we know that there were over 3,000 hospitalisations for heart and lung disease and 417 excess deaths. I was monitoring also the particulate matters during that time. Victoria was great in that uh, the EPA Victoria were reporting it and it was quite accessible even to the hour. And, and the levels were extraordinary up to from 500 up to 1,000 and more. And you couldn't escape it. There was no escape from the smoke. And the general advice was to stay indoors and close your windows and doors. Um, so it was a pretty horrific time and bushfires, if we have more in the future, are, are quite harmful to human health. And unfortunately, uh, there's not much we can do during that time, apart from staying indoors, and maybe wearing P2 masks. Yeah. Um I suppose it just brings home to us the effects of, you know, that climate change isn't just about heat, but it's also about smoke and that, you know, what, you know, I think the pollution is such an interesting thing because we have pollution from burning fossil fuels and fossil fuels increases bushfires and that increases smoke and then we get um, all the respiratory and cardiovascular effects from that. And, you know, there's a number of people talking in the chat about prescribed burnings and things. And, you know, I wonder what, I don't know, I feel like that's a harder question to, you know, yeah. sort of get. Yeah, uh, I'm, not, so. I'm actually in the Yarra Valley at the moment. And during the day, you can actually see the smoke from hazard reduction burning. And, and it is a problem. It's quite thick, the smoke. And almost certainly it will impact the communities and the people who are living and working in that area. What the Department of Environment do is that they drop off notices into people's letterbox to let them know that hazard reduction burning is happening mm -hmm. to allow them to, to do something else, to go into the city or spend time somewhere else to avoid the inhalation of smoke during that time. But it is a problem. And the other thing is, is, is it really effective is the other the other question. I think the evidence is mounting that it's not. What, like avoiding? There's a, there's a lot of scientific evidence mounting that hazard reduction burns actually are pretty ineffective at preventing severe fires. Yeah, low, destroy wildlife. low temperature fire doesn't necessarily prevent a high temperature fire coming through later. Yeah, yeah right. But, but I, think, I think there is increasing, but look, I think the fire problem, there's no really good way out of this because it has a reduction that I understand it has some role in preventing big fires and we're going to have either big fires or little fires. At least with hazard reduction, they could be chosen to be done on a day when the wind is blowing away from most people. But of course, you, you can't have it blowing where there's nobody because mostly there's people everywhere. So at least they can try to do it on a day that's blowing away from the biggest cities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um... I'm just, I'm just reading the chat because there was something else in here that um, there was a stuff about Dorothy Robinson has written something about PM 2.5 pollution in Musselbrook. And um, Bob, you answered in the chat about something that you wanted to talk about there. Yeah, so the, the document that linked Dorothy is fantastic. The um, only thing that might be worth adding to that is actually the street maps view um, of the air quality monitor in Musselbrook because one of the inherent problems. Just uh, firstly, I want to put out that I absolutely agree that we should be banning recreational wood burning and that yes, we all should, should be addressing wood smoke here. So I'm not defending it in any way, but um, the narrative is used inappropriate here about wood smoke in Musselbrook being the dominant source of pollution to the extent that the mines and the power stations are saying it's not our problem, it's not our fault. Um, so we, we kind of 
when you look at the detail on street maps of where that monitor sits and you spin 360 degrees around, you could kind of see about 20 or 30 chimneys. They're really, there's a couple of closely located within 50 metre old brick houses that actually have four or five chimneys. Um, and so I think when you compare that to other fixed site monitors that have uh, particle characterization studies, there's potentially a little bit of false elevation there of how much of the annual PM 2.5 is attributable to um, wood smoke in the, the greater Musselbrook area, certainly in that fixed site monitor. Yeah, absolutely. But that, I don't think that's a true representation of all of Musselbrook. Um, Singleton and Musselbrook have very similar demographics. So there would be no reason why um, there would be such a significant difference between wood heater use between Singleton and Musselbrook. Um, so yes, well, well, we definitely do need to be reducing um, pollution attributable to uh, recreational wood burning and, and unnecessary wood burning in houses. Um, be careful because minerals councils and power station owners jump on that data that, and they're very quick to jump on that. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what this means for us clinically as doctors. So when we're, um, I'm very interested in all the stuff about, um, you know, development in children and, um, you know, I think the stuff you showed has been about asthma and, you know, asthma incidences in children is, you know, like quite a fascinating number you gave, 60,000 less children with asthma in Australia um, associated with NO2 exposure. I mean, that's like, this is a really big number. And, you know, you think about school drop-off and, you know, what all that means and, you um, you know, like, I just wonder if anybody on the panel, um, maybe Kathleen, we haven't heard from you, if anything um, about, you know, clinically when you're talking to people about what they can do to reduce their risk for asthma, if, you know, if pollution comes up for you, if it's something that, you know, people here are feeling confident to talk about. Well, I found that at the time of the bushfires, it was, I actually found myself bringing up the air quality monitoring and showing it to people and saying, look, this is the, not the day that you are going outside because, um, you know, because you're not well. Of course, I've, I've, I'm in a, work in an area where there actually wasn't any really useful local air quality monitoring because even though we do have the two coal-fired power stations in Lake Macquarie, it was only, you know, six months after the bushfires, they thought that they needed to put an air quality monitor in, but that's by the by. Um, but I think that um, it's it's something that it's worth making people aware of what's going on around them. And I find that oftentimes people aren't very conscious of things like climate shifts and, you know, when it's very heavy, heavy pollen days and that's why they're feeling all stuffy and they're having trouble breathing. And, and I think helping people be more aware of the world around them does help them manage their symptoms better. Um, but... Incidentally, I think a lot of the advice about staying inside, I'm not sure, I think it does help a little bit, but I found it very interesting when we did have the bushfires. I'd actually bought a um, air purifier, which had a little um, monitor on it not long beforehand, and I started running it, and I was really surprised about um, how polluted the air was in my house when we would wake up in the morning, um, you know, often having it fairly, you know, closed up, um, and then you know, even, even then in our house, how poisonous the air was at that time was really, really disturbing. And I guess sometimes I wonder how much we should be recommending air quality, like air purifiers with good quality HEPA filters as something that could be helping our um, patients. And I guess I think compared to when we, everyone was trying to buy an air purifier 12 months ago, they are starting to get a bit more affordable, but um, that might be another clinical option that is useful for a lot of people. Yeah, so do you think sometimes the staying inside advice is... Well, it depends what your house is like because a lot of people as well, you know, I work in an area, um, you know, one of the places I work is the poorest suburb, you know, the poorest postcode in New South Wales. Um, and it's a lot of people who are in very leaky, um, poor quality housing with not a lot of good cooling um, or heating options. And I think that... Um, that it's really hard to say, you know, stay in your house, lock all the doors and you'll be good because there's lots of other issues that are, you know, in a, in a leaky, um, associated with being in a leaky house. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, that might mean that someone's very 
hot and stuffy and you know lots of other issues then yeah thank you Vicky you've got your hand up there uh, like Kathleen I've got an air purifier at work and that's really fascinating it actually sits at the back of me my work is in an urban area near a freeway and the local patients there do suffer seem to suffer from the effects of air pollution and it's really interesting when I wasn't aware of the effects of air pollution, I used to treat patients with sinusitis and all sorts of respiratory symptoms and not put the connection together, whereas now I do. And having the air purifier there is really good because they can look at the numbers and understand the level of pollution that's happening from the major freeways, uh, but also relating it to their symptoms. So now my patients seem to come back and say, oh, my sinus is all cleaned up. It was a really high pollution day. Um, so it's really good that I've been able to work with patients into helping them to connect with their symptoms, whether it's an asthma attack or a sinus problem, uh, sore throat, cough, etc., with the level of air pollution. And as Ben mentioned, uh, that level of air pollution, how it affects the patient is all to do with proximity and also weather dependent and depends on the winds, temperature, cloud yeah. cover, etc. And yeah. now patients have been able to make that connection with the weather patterns as well. So yeah, I, I do think pollution is a fabulous way of making people realise that um, what mm -hmm. we're doing with our combustion of fossil fuels is a health mm -hmm. effect for them personally and a way into talking about the climate crisis. Yeah. And there's um, another question that I think that I'd like to see answered. But before I do, I just want to remind the attendees that in the link, I've posted um, a link to, in the chat, sorry, I've posted a link to the evaluation form for this evening. And if people would love like to do that, that would be very helpful, especially if you're an RACGP or ACRA member and you want to get your points for this evening, you need to click on that link and get it back to us. That'd be fabulous. Um, but what I'd like to ask, uh, Ben. I answered a question that I saw in the chat there. Someone was asking about kind of small do-it-yourself monitors. I yeah. thought I'd show off this gadget. Okay, your gadget. So this little thing here is an air beam. It measures PM 2.5. Um, it has pretty good you know, calibration and validity data out of some people who've compared it to more official monitors. Um, so this is a, a Mark I air beam. I think they've since got a different one that, that looks a bit different in the case, but does the same things internally. Um, this works together with an Android phone and uses the GPS in the phone to track what the air quality is where you are. So it's quite interesting to take it for a walk or you know, where, while riding a bike to work and you can see where you're exposed to sort of high levels and low levels of pollutants, of fine particle pollutants, you know, as you go about your daily business. Um, they're not really um, made to use as compliance instruments. So you can't stick it somewhere and say, well, this is what the daily average was because the battery doesn't go for 24 hours. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating thing to play around with to work out, you know, what your local air pollution story is. So I got them off some website. It's called an air beam and it comes together with some software called uh, air casting and it costs about 200 American dollars. Oh, I love a bit of a game. Yeah. So much fun. Yeah. Um, we've got another question here about bicycling. So what advice should we give to our patients regarding exercising or commuting by bikes in our major cities? You know, and obviously we're asking people to ride bikes as a health co-benefit um, to reduce their emissions. But um, yeah, would anyone like to answer that question? You can get um, air pollution masks through a cycling shop. So there are masks made, um, you see people wearing them in sort of Asia and, and Europe. They're made for cycling with, so they're very low resistance. You can breathe hard through them without noticing impedance. And yeah, so you find, you'll find them at an online bicycle shop, a mask specially built for that purpose. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about if you just if you have an electric bike, you... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. If you have an electric bike, you don't have to ride so hard and you reduce your tidal volume compared to a regular bike. Hold your breath, <laughs> I always, I do like to plug the electric bike. 
Oh, completely agree. I <laughs> love them. What about if you're cycling on the cycle track and not on the main road behind the bus? Is that a reasonable thing to say to people? Get off the major roads? And yeah, look, I think it's part of designing good cycleways is they should not be adjacent to a busy road if they can, if they can help it. So it's all got to do with proximity. So the closer you are to the vehicle and the exhaust, the worse it is. The yeah. further away you are, the better. You could also I wasn't going to say it. But... <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, um, someone said it in the chat, so I wasn't going to mention it, but Teslas have inbuilt HEPA filters, so the other solution is just to everyone buy a Tesla. <laughs> yeah. I think we should declare a conflict of interest, Bob, that you're going to tell them to get a Tesla. I'm going to tell everyone to get an electric bike. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so look, I think we've just, we, we've sort of done our hour. Um, thank you, everybody, for, um, thank you, Bob and Kath and Vicky and Ben, especially thank you, Ben, for your presentation. But thank you, everybody, for being on the panel. Um, thank you to everybody who's come along and listened to us speak tonight. Um, we do, as I said, the evaluation form is in the chat. And we do have a our next After Hours webinar series will be presented by Rosemary Stanton, the nutritionist on um, what we can do as far as what we eat and protecting our climate. But I think the thing I'd like to just say to finish is that you know, air pollution is a massive health risk factor. And it just shows that, you know, the way we live in our society, the way we combust fossil fuels for energy and, you know, for all aspects of our society is obviously completely, you know, very detrimental to our planet. And I think everybody here is up to date with the climate crisis, but it also has personal effects for all of us, for all of our patients. And, you know, what a great way in to making the climate crisis personal. All right, that's all I've got to say. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>